The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 7 and verses 9 through 11. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Paul's Struggle with Sin. Through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank thee for thyself, and for all that thou dost daily reveal thyself to be. Bless the truth to each heart in this hour, and may it come to convict those who have not been born again, and to bless those who have trusted in thee, that we may be to the praise of thy glory who have trusted in Christ. And we ask it in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus. Amen. We are studying in Romans 7 and come today to verses 9 to 11. Romans 7, 9 to 11. And I was alive apart from the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. The very commandment which promised life proved to be death to me. But sin, taking advantage through the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. Now the experience through which Saul of Tarsus passed while on the road to Damascus was divine and soul-searching to the highest degree. Suddenly he realized that the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he had been persecuting, was none other than the Messiah for whom he had been waiting. There was a tremendous readjustment in all his thinking, and the process of this readjustment is traceable in his writings. He had asked, Who art thou, Lord? And the answer had come, I am Jesus. Paul had used the word for Lord, which covered the highest deity. In all probability, since he had been steeped in rabbinical lore, he had used the Hebrew word Adonai, which was commonly used by the scribes when they came to the word Jehovah in the texts. It was thus that Paul addressed the being who spoke to him in the way and learned the great truth of the second person of the Godhead. But he had not yet known the third person of the Godhead. It was not long before the Lord appeared again to Paul as he was lodged in a house in Damascus. Arise, he was told, and be baptized and wash away your sins. Now it should be noted that there was no question of washing away sin. That had been done in his justification by the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But his sins, the outbreak of the old nature in acts that are contrary to the word and will of God, these, in Paul or in us, are removed by the word of God, of which water is nothing more than a symbol. There is no question here of regeneration by baptism or of the removal of sins by water. It was in answer to the Lord's supernatural arrangement that Ananias came to the house in the street called Straight, saying, the Lord, even Jesus, who appeared unto thee in the way which thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mayest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. On the road to Damascus, he had learned to know God the Son, even as he had known God the Father from his childhood, and now he was to learn to know God the Holy Spirit. It must be noted that no part of this work had any reference whatsoever to the law. Paul had been raised in the law according to the straightest, the narrowest sect of the Pharisees. But all that now happens to him is in grace and by grace alone. The Lord Jesus appeared to him in grace. He is led to Damascus by grace. He receives the visit of Ananias by grace. And this man speaks to him nothing but words of grace. The law does not enter into this work of grace at any point. Immediately we find Paul entering into the synagogues of Damascus, preaching with joy and triumph that Jesus is the Son of God. This was the entire theme of his preaching at this point in his ministry. He had no other message for the moment. This was the joy of his salvation, the knowledge of complete justification through the work of the Messiah who has become his Savior, his sin bearer. It must have been amazing at every step for him to realize suddenly that all of the lambs which had given their lives on the altars of his people had been but the faint shadows of the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. In our text in Romans, he refers back to this happy time in Damascus. 
I do not believe you will be able to locate our text otherwise than at this moment in his experience. For in Romans 7, in this verse 9, we read, I was alive apart from the law once. The confraternity translation reads, Once upon a time I was living without law. Now, this certainly cannot be spoken of any moment before his experience on the Damascus Road, nor can it be a description of any moment after the re-entering of the law. I am convinced that many Christians go through a similar experience in our day. In fact, I went through it myself. I cannot tell at what time I was born of the Spirit into the family of God. I am convinced that most people who are saved really have been saved long before they think they are. Most Christians who point back to some experience in life as being the time of salvation are really pointing back to the time when they became aware of the presence of eternal life within them. Many of us in early childhood are taught to believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. A child recites John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He believes it. And if you ask him if he loves the Lord Jesus and accepts him as his Savior, the child does so without question. And I believe that this child is saved, even though he does not understand much of what he is saying. Now, because the child is not well taught yet, he comes to think that he may not be saved because he becomes aware of the presence of sin in his life. His position is not helped by the constant presentation of emotional appeal and by the false doctrinal teaching, which states that if there is sin, there is no salvation. At times there are years of Christian life lost in this wavering, fruitless period. And then, sometimes years later, there comes the day when the soul understands that the debt of sin was really paid, and that he is the present possessor of eternal life. There is such great joy that, at times, the individual thinks that this is the moment of his regeneration, when in reality, it is the moment of his entering into the assurance of the present possession of eternal life. This is the period, to borrow a biblical phrase, that might be called the period of the joy of salvation. When David lost this joy, he cried out to the Lord that it might be restored unto him in the 51st Psalm. There is that poignant cry, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. The salvation was not gone, but the joy of salvation was gone. And this same loss of the joy of salvation is an experience in the lives of very many believers, an experience that occurs soon after the coming of assurance. The individual has finally come to know the joy of salvation, the assurance of salvation, the knowledge of of the present possession of eternal life. The day-by-day -day walk is one that seems to be among the clouds, and then suddenly the old nature manifests itself in some conflict with the law of God, and the joy is gone. The fellowship with the Lord is broken, and in some cases there is even a period of doubt of salvation. Now if we understand the general nature of the experiences which we have just outlined, we will be able to understand the text in which Paul describes what happened to him in those days following the experience of the Damascus Road. He was alive apart from the law. Oh, to be freed from the ceremonial washings, washings to the elbows, as the Greek has it, to be freed from all of the restrictions of a detailed legalistic system, and to be brought into the glorious liberty of the children of God was indeed a heart-stirring experience. He knew himself to be alive. He was now separated from the law. He had entered into grace. But suddenly there was an awareness of the continuing existence of sin. Some thought of the law of God, some thought of the holiness of God, brought forth the dormant old nature. The commandment of God came before the conscience of the apostle. Sin flamed up within him, and Paul died. Or rather, perhaps we must understand it, that Saul of Tarsus died. There was the death of any thought that anything could be accomplished through himself. There was the death of any hope of strength or any hope of victory through himself. 
Remember that Paul did not have a New Testament in his hands at this time. He had the memory of the Old Testament, and he must have remembered the law of God, which said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Oh, how many verses there are throughout the law which demand that which it is totally impossible for the law's followers to see fulfilled in practice. Paul must have remembered that the priests had on their foreheads a plate of pure gold with words engraven on the gold, holiness to the Lord. Paul's great knowledge of the Old Testament would have caused him to run through it in his mind, and he could not go more than a few chapters before some great command unto holiness would thrust a sword into his heart. Yet he knew that the Old Testament law had been ordained by God in order to bring his people to himself. The commandment was indeed, as our text in Romans states, unto life. It promised life. In spite of this, Paul says, the very commandment which promised life proved to be death to me. Let us consider how the commandment promised life. On Mount Sinai, when the law was about to be given, the first words reminded Paul and every other follower of Moses of the fact that God had done a great work for them. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now, if anything ever began auspiciously, it was the Ten Commandments. In the midst of the commandments, there were also words of promise. God reminded them that he showed mercy unto thousands of generations of them that loved him. Long life was promised to those who kept one of the commandments. And when the people were afraid after the giving of the commandments, Moses said to them, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. We skim through the accounts that are in the books of Moses, and we find passages that shine out with promise. Seventy elders go up unto the mount with Moses, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and, as it were, the body of heaven in its clearness. They saw God, and did eat and drink. The glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, we read. And then after the description of the ark of the testimony were the comforting words, There I will meet with them, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat of all things that I will give thee. In preparing the garments of the priests and the articles of worship, the Lord filled the wise-hearted with his spirit of wisdom for the execution of the work which was done with joy. And yet it was after all this that the people induced Aaron to make them a calf of gold and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, that brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And thus it is seen that the law which brought a promise of life also entered into its ministration of death. In fact, in the second epistle to the Corinthians, the law given in the commandments is branded with the horrible name, 2 Corinthians 3, 7, the ministration of death. And in the ninth verse, the ministration of condemnation. And this is what Paul discovered for himself, perhaps in the desert of Arabia. He had come from Damascus with the fresh joy of the knowledge of justification, but still thinking himself under law. He received the rude jolt of its true and inward meaning. It became to him the producer of death. For, says verse 11, sin, seizing occasion through the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. It was at this point in his desert experience that the horror of indwelling sin made itself known to Paul. Like a dormant reptile, sin had been in Paul all of the time, but suddenly he finds it to be alive, and it slays him. Phillips paraphrases this text. The commandment gave sin an opportunity, and without my realizing what was happening, it killed me. Now, the word that is translated deceived is rendered beguiled in the revisions, and it is thus translated in another passage of our King James. It is the word which is used in Paul's exhortation to the Corinthians, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted. As the serpent beguiled Eve, 
The Greek word translated deceived, beguiled, means wholly seduced. Thus it was that sin cheated Paul. It made him think that he could stand in his own strength. It brought him to the place where it lured him into the hope that he could take care of any situation which might arise through some power that he fancied himself to possess in his own will. The result was catastrophic. Paul was brought to the place of utter despair. Thus it was that the commandment slew him, the commandment upon which he had relied throughout all of his life, the commandment which he had always looked upon as being the perfect law of God. Later he will write to another church, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. But here in the seventh chapter of Romans, Paul tells of the time when he thought that he was standing and that he could continue in his own strength. Suddenly he found himself in the midst of that horrible moment that is like a man walking on ice who suddenly knows that he has lost his footing and there is no possible means of breaking the fall which has already begun. The law of gravity is in its inexorable working and there is no power whatsoever within the man who is falling to stop the dread consequences of the tragedy that is in the process of being. And humanly speaking, there is nothing above him or around him upon which he may lay hold to break his fall. The solution does not come before another half dozen verses in our text, and we must treat them in order. But I believe it's necessary for me to go forward to the end for a moment in order to tell any soul that is in the horrible process of attempting to ward off the disasters that must come from sin's presence in the flesh that there is the power to have victory. That power is in the realization of our union with the Lord Jesus Christ in his death and in his resurrection. It is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life. It is for you now. You do not have to wait until you have heard another half dozen of these studies. Abandon all hope in yourself and take the place of death in order that you may know life indeed. You will never come to the place of victory through resolutions. It's best indeed not to make resolutions. You will never come to the place of victory through making vows to God. No believer should ever make a vow under any circumstance. You will never come to the place of triumph through attempts to taper off some bad habit or through any attempt to give up this or that sin. Your only hope is to throw yourself upon the grace of God and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as you would throw yourself from the top of a cliff into the ocean that lies beneath. Only then can you come to the place of triumph through the Holy Spirit in the Lord Jesus Christ. The experience through which Paul was going was all the more horrible because of his background and training. He had been brought up as a student of the law. He had gone to Jerusalem to sit at the feet of Gamaliel, a noted teacher of the ceremonial law. I, I cannot see Saul of Tarsus in the terms that some have attempted to describe him. He was not a man who was occupied with nothing more than feasts, new moons, and the Sabbath days. He was concerned with far more than the length of a Sabbath day's journey and such like things. He has revealed to us that even before the road to Damascus, he was blameless as touching the righteous demands of the law. That is, he had not had open transgressions of any of the laws of God. He had not lied. He had not committed fornication. He had not been a thief. The law, he tells Timothy, is not for the righteous, but for those who commit such actions. And he thanks God for the divine grace that put him in the ministry. And he says, I was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And a close reading of all the epistles will reveal that the unbelief was not that of the unregenerate man, but the unbelief of a man who was so profoundly biased by warped teaching that he followed in all honesty the bent of the Pharisees until the Lord himself turned him around on the road to Damascus. As I see Saul of Tarsus, according to that which I find in the Acts and in his epistles, he was a man who throughout his youth 
had been able to sing the 119th Psalm with all his heart. The whole atmosphere of Paul's life could have been expressed in such terms as these used by David in that great psalm. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. And so on throughout the psalm. And if it be objected that Saul of Tarsus killed Christians and that therefore he was unsaved at the time, we will answer that David was a man after God's own heart and that he walked in a path of self-will that took him to adultery and murder. Yet God put upon David's lips the sweetest psalms, both before and after he had ill-treated Bathsheba and Uriah. And certainly Moses was God's servant throughout all his history, prepared by God for specific purposes, and brought by God in sovereign grace to the fulfillment of those purposes. And Simon Peter was the Lord's own man, not only during the three years he walked with him, but also in that black moment when he denied him with oaths and cursings. And Jesus looked upon him, and he was brought back into the place of fellowship and power. Personally, I can see nothing else in the Bible than a similar pattern of the grace of God in the life of Saul who becomes Paul. It is all of grace and what comfort it can be for many of you who have walked in the same dark path and for whom God has, right now, in the Holy Spirit, a sunrise for a new day of triumph. And our God and Father, we pray thee to bless each truth to the hearts of those who listen in this hour. If there be those who have not been born again, give them restlessness, that they may know no peace until they rest in Christ. But upon thine own who have truly believed in thee, may thy grace, thy mercy, and thy peace abide. And a new sense of triumph in the Spirit of God and unto thee be the glory and the majesty, the dominion and the power, now and forever. Amen.